All right, this is the beginning of chapter 12. It's entitled Crystalline Solids and Modern Materials. I am only going to cover sections 1 through 3, which does not contain modern materials, just focuses on crystalline solids. If you're using the free book online, OpenStax, it's uh, embedded into chapter 10, focus on the solid part. Uh, basically, the way that atoms are arranged in the crystalline phase, right? Because you can have solids that are uh, in a powder or just a, an amorphous surface. It, it doesn't have to be a crystal. But if it is a crystal, we can actually use X-ray analysis to determine uh, all of the content of that crystal, all of the atoms that are in it and the distance to each other and then the bond angles. And so, so this is a very important technique that we use to determine the structure of materials and molecules as long as we can grow a crystal or find a crystal uh, we can do that and so what happens is the atoms in a crystal will arrange over three-dimensional space just uh, the same way okay so you I mean you get trillions and trillions of atoms in a particular crystal and if they are always at the same distance and the same a repeating unit, we call that a unit cell, then, then we can use that x-ray analysis. Now, these crystals shown here are all of the same material. It's called alum. You, you may have uh, heard of it. Alum is used uh, for pickling to keep the, the cucumbers crisp, I guess. Uh, so this is called alum. And it's actually an ionic solid. It's potassium aluminum sulfate. Okay, so you've got potassium, aluminum, and sulfate ions. This is an ionic compound. And when you dissolve that and you, you let it slowly evaporate, then you can grow these, these crystals. So as I said, these are all the same. You, you, you can kind of see they, they kind of grow triangular. And, uh, uh, but, but that's not important. The importance here is that if there are no cracks and if you have a single crystal, and it doesn't have to be a very large one, you can use this x-ray analysis to determine uh, the content, right? Uh, for example, here we have, uh, this is uh, a sodium chloride. We call this a unit cell. In green here, we have the chloride atoms. And in red, we have the sodium ions, okay? So chloride ions and, and sodium ions. And, and, and so if you take a, a crystal out of a salt shaker, and you do an x-ray analysis on it, you'll find that this is how these solids order, right? And so we, 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 we know this already because we talked about ions, right? We have cations and anions, and I already told you that those spheres will connect and, and, and uh, inter, uh, uh, electrostatically, and they just kind of pack like this. Now here it's shown where you can actually see the uh, a little bit more detail the the atoms but of course these atoms in real size we'll see pictures in a minute they're they're much larger and they touch each other they pack as tightly as possible so sodium chloride is is a cubic unit cell you can see it looks kind of like a cube and so you have the length height and width all of the same so we have here a equals b equals c they are all the same and, and so this is equal to the length and that makes that a cube and also all of the degrees are 90 degrees here right the the angles not the degrees the angles are all 90 uh, here right and so then the if you take a look at the center here with the chlorine is you'll see that there they are actually six of those sodium ions it's kind of hard to tell but there's actually six sodium ions that are attached to that chloride. So, so that has a, we call that a coordination number. Oops, that's an N coordination number. And, and the coordination number for, for chloride here is, is six, meaning it is surrounded at the same distance to six other ions. And, it's also important to note that this is the smallest repeating unit, right? So we have this cube here with the content that's shown. And, and so if you put another cube next to it, we'll see if my art survives this. Ah, too bad. It will have the exact same content, right? And so then there's also some parts where, where the atoms are shared, right? So like, uh, this here, the sodium on the corner here, 
is actually sharing not just two other cells, right? Because it's if it's actually eight different cells, because you have to, and, and this is where my art is truly going to fail. But so in order to completely enclose that, you have to put, and then you have to put a second layer on top. I'll try my best. You, you kind of get the idea. Oh, this is turning out not to be too bad here, right? So in order, and then there's, uh, uh, yeah. So there are actually eight cubes. This. What this means to make a long story short is that this particular atom on the corner there is part of eight total cells, which means it only contributes one eighth to the unit cell content. All right, and we'll, we'll look at that in, in more detail. Now, this is a cartoon showing how X ray crystallography works. All right, so the instrument used is called an X ray diffractometer. You basically are shooting a, a focused beam through a slit here, that's how you can focus it into that single crystal and the x-rays will bounce off the atoms at, an, at a certain angle and, and create a pattern here as you can see on this plate, on this detector and uh, uh, you have to collect a, about 7,000 or more beams depending on how complex the structure of the molecule is and, uh, and then you can determine the bond distance here, right? This is a hexagonal cell that they're showing here. You can then determine the distance between these atoms and all of those bond angles and how they arrange over three-dimensional space. And then the smallest unit of the repeating crystal structure is called the unit cell, which I've already said like three times now. This is what an actual diffractometer looks like. Uh, and it allows you to twist the crystal and collect from all angles. There's a device called the guyometer that can rotate. Your crystal is actually uh, mounted into inside of a very tiny glass capillary so it doesn't shift. So this thing rotates and the x-ray beam is shot through here. It is stationary and so the crystal uh, rotates and so you can also rotate this disc so you can get uh, collecting data from all different angles. Now it turns out that there are seven major crystal systems in which all molecules crystallize or, or uh, are found in the crystalline state in nature or I mean, they had to crystallize at some point and uh, <clears throat> they don't, are not all cubic they are they get more and more complex as the length the size differ of the box and all the way to even a hexagonal cell so you have to remember that this is the this is just a single unit and that then these all of these boxes or shapes are connected to fill out uh, over three-dimensional space and uh, here's just a summary you, you can see for the most ordered one the cubic unit cell where all the angles are 90 degrees and all of the length of the edge are the same and then you just change one of these uh, length and so you don't you, you now have a box not a cube keep the angles the same it's a little bit less uh, symmetrical and that's called a tetragonal unit cell and and uh, you just make it less and less symmetrical and you end up with uh, a triclinic cell at the end which has no uh, none of the degrees are 90 everything is different or even a hexagonal cell as I mentioned uh, so this is a molecule, it's cyclotrimethylene trinitramine, which is an explosive. It's uh, referred to as RDX, much easier, rolling over the tongue, RDX research, uh, explosive. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that if you have a more complex molecule, it can't pack as tightly as, as individual atoms. And, but they still crystallize in a unit cell. And this looks like a tetragonal unit cell to me. It's hard to tell, but looking straight at it, it still looks like a square. But then one of the lengths is, is different here, the one that, uh, that goes to the back, whether that's the width or the length, who knows, right? It depends on how you're holding that crystal or the unit cell. Uh, uh, but uh, so this is the repeating unit and, and so you see parts of molecules sticking out, right? If we, if we look at, at this part that sticks out on top, it is actually part of the next unit. So we expect that to, f to find that down here and, and, and we do. So that exact part that's sticking out is of course on the other unit cell that's connected on top. 
uh, to be found again and you can do this with every single part of this unit cell here like like here's a part that's sticking out to the right of it and then obviously you're gonna find it here uh, it, it dissects the molecule but the repeating unit is here nicely shown and that's why I selected this particular slide because it shows nicely what the repeating unit is here as I said we will look at only a few of the cubic unit cells uh, here are three examples how atoms can pack differently within the cubic unit cell the simple cubic unit cell shown here on the top only has atoms on each corner which we we would like to determine the unit cell content and so we already know that each corner is one eighth of the contribution so if you have eight corners occupied there's only a single atom occupying the the, uh, the unit cell so there's just one atom in here inside of it and uh, you can also see that the pecking efficiency is not very good here you have a lot of empty space right and so the pecking efficiency which is something we're going to be looking at is only 52 percent in a simple uh, cubic cell unit cell we also want to be able to look at the radius and length relationship so we're going to be looking you, you can kind of see that in the simple unit cell it's easy to see that because there these these two atoms are connected uh, without any space whereas here there's some space that the length is going to be equal to two times the radius uh, for example that's that's easy to see so but we want to be able to do that for the body centered cubic unit cell as well as the face as well as the face centered cell so we're going to look at uh, pecking efficiency we're going to look at the relationship between the radius and the length of the unit cell and the coordination number so how many other atoms are attached to each other and then uh, uh, the, the cell content so that's what we're going to be looking at so for now uh, the body centered unit cells uh, of course are packed a little bit more efficiently you insert an atom into the center and and so that goes up to 68 percent you can really nicely see if you look at this at this picture that we have an entire atom you can nicely see that the entire atom is completely embedded in the unit cell uh, inside of it and whereas the one in the corner is just a one-eighth so this chunk is just one-eighth of one of the atoms which is part of the cell and, and, and so it's really nicely shown in the space it's really hard to see on top but it shows us where the atoms are located and as long as we understand inside means the entire atom is part of the content and on the corner just means it is uh, a one-eighth and then for the face centered cubic unit cell if we have an atom on the face you can see this this is cut in half so each atom on the face is contributing a half to the unit cell which means for the face centered to cubic unit cell if each face has the six sides has one that means there are three atoms uh, total part of the unit cell of course here you also have the corners we'll look at each of these in particular uh, for now I just want to say the face centered cubic unit cell is the one that is uh, pecked the most efficiently at 74% and so next we're going to look at those things that I said, uh, you, you know, don't, don't even go get a Coke, just, just go watch the next video.